The following interview was conducted with Lynn Doyle, Office of University Periodicals, on Wednesday uh, for the Purdue University Oral History Program on Wednesday, uh, November 26, 2008. This is part two of the interview. Welcome. We'll pick up where Thank we you. left off. We're talking about online in the publications that you were pretty much involved with. I, I think online was probably one of the things that, uh, toward the end of my career, um, was one of the most exciting things that we got into because um, we could reach so many more people. And uh, we could also leave things on the website uh, for people to go back and look at, especially we did a lot of history stories, especially when Jay Cooperwriter was on the staff. He, he delved into a lot of history topics, and it was great to ha have those things on the web so people could see um, the real facts. You know, there's so many traditions at Purdue, like the whole how did we get the Boilermaker's name and everything like that, that once Jay researched those stories, we felt like th there needed to be a place where people could go for the real facts and everything. So uh, we were pretty excited when we started online. Uh, the thing that has happened is that print publications have become, uh, well, just like with newspapers, it's, um, it's much more expensive to do print publications. The newsprint costs a lot of money. The mailing is what really uh, is a thing that, that kills you. And uh, so doing a lot of the things online rather than printed copies Number one, you can get the information online a lot faster. Uh, witness Purdue today now. And that's something that we would have loved to have uh, during the years I was there, but you know, it, it just wasn't possible at that time. Um, and it, it's cheaper. So um, the, the part that concerns all of us who were in the field of communications is that we feel like online limits our audience. And we have struggled hard to make sure that we still do have publications that have the main information in there that are printed versions that can go to people who aren't web savvy or who don't like to receive their information or look at publications online. Um, there's fewer, we have fewer issues uh, now than when I left, but um, the access is still there, but it's, it's a lot more limited. Sure, that's yeah. right. Uh, one of the things on the historical thing, uh, having it electronic, you get a lot of, que you, like archives and special collections, there are journal couriers writing an article or in um, the star is, and they want some piece of Purdue history to put into it, mm -hmm. so you get these reference calls, for want of a yeah. better term. And it's easier when it's stored electronically, you can pull it up right. <laughs> yeah. very quickly. And, uh, yeah, and, you know, one, one of the things that we really tried to do in our office of periodicals is anytime anybody called us, we didn't care who it was, was to find them the information. And we got a lot of calls from alumni, a lot of calls from the media. And I, I think the Journal Courier, Courier especially, because uh, when uh, I hired both Julie Rosa and Jay Cooperwriter in that office, and both of them had been at the Journal Courier, so people knew them and you know knew that they did good work and everything and would get back to sure. them. And so I think we probably fielded quite a few media calls in addition to the news service calls just because people knew us in the office, and then I'd been around for so long. That's so right. Kevin Cullen was one that uh, I yeah. dealt with, and, and he did some interviews on the Amelia Earhart and who uh -huh. used to call, because he knew, he, he, and he'd been around a long time, yeah. too, and now he's with the uh, Catholic publication yeah. there. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, Kevin was one when um, Jay went to athletics that I, I really wish that he had applied for the job. But, you know, that wasn't the direction he wanted to go sure. in. So, but Kevin's great. Yeah. You know. What about the liaison with the regional campuses? Do you have any? Uh, yeah. We, you know, one of the things we really try to do, especially in perspective and 
inside Purdue was to make sure there was a regional campus present. So each of the regional campuses had, at least when I was working, had uh, a news service type um, um, operation. And so, yeah, we, we relied on them a lot. We made visits to the regional campuses, and the, uh, especially, you know, Dave Umberger and then Vince Walter um, would go up and shoot pictures of the regional campus on a regular basis. Uh, the other uh, great opportunity I had was both CSAC and ABSAC, Clerical and Service Staff Advisory Committee and Administrative and Professional Staff Advisory Committee, once a year would visit one of the regional campuses and sort of do an in-depth tour there. And it was great for for those of us in my office who went because we picked up on, you know, some stories that maybe people hadn't let us know about, right. you know. And to get familiar with the campuses and how they're arranged and what they look like and everything was very important. When we're when you're writing about something you want to, you know, sort of have that first hand. Not knowledge. a word picture but you like a yeah. real visual thing yeah. and sort of that yeah. you can it helps in your writing. I think yeah. that's true too. Um, let's go down to the um, outreach and wall and your special interest in chocolate. Yeah, that I was trying to think of when that really started. Um, probably in the late 80s, early 90s. I've always liked chocolate. When um, I was in my teen years, I was very, very thin. And the doctor, I, I wouldn't eat breakfast. And the doctor told my oh, mom, dear. if all she will eat is chocolate cake and or a chocolate milkshake give it to her <laughs> you know at least she's got something in her and so you know I've liked chocolate since I was young and so has my husband and uh I think both of us like brownies the best and I I had a hard time cooking brownies and getting the inside you know to set up like the outside you know it's always sort of liquidy well, he got fascinated with the whole baking process. He doesn't cook, but he got fascinated with baking. So now he's the chocolate. Anything, any dessert type of thing, he's the one pretty much who makes the desserts. And he has a collection of about 500 chocolate cookbooks or books about chocolate. And um, we got more involved. We went, uh, we read something in, I think it was Midwest Midwest, maybe? Midwestern Living? Yeah, Midwest yeah. Living, right. And about a bed and breakfast in Oregon, Illinois, uh, that specialized in chocolate. The lady had a lot of chocolate books, and she did a chocolates and tea in the afternoon and things like that. So we went over and stayed a few days there. Got to know, her name is Sharon Burdick, got to know her really well and found out that she did this education program called Candy College and it's using chocolate and candy to teach young children and she goes to schools and does special presentations. She's like the candy lady that comes to school but teaches them math, geography, ingredients, health type things, reading nutrition labels on candy bars and learning where all the ingredients comes from and stuff like that and we were fascinated with that whole idea and we what kept, a great thing yeah it's it's really because children she, don't normally get that uh, yeah, opportunity or yeah you know, and certainly I didn't it, it's it's fun she does a program up uh, at Garfield Park in uh, Chicago uh, just totally on on chocolate during Valentine's season and I think she does one at Easter also but but we have gone and helped her with some programs. We've just be, I mean we've become really good friends, and uh, she through um, Sharon we met Elaine Gonzalez who has written a couple of books on chocolate, and um, my husband took a a, cho a class on chocolate artistry from Elaine, and. Um, Elaine was, who also lives in Chicago, the Field Museum was doing a chocolate exhibit in conjunction with the Smithsonian. And the researchers at the Field Museum called upon Elaine to, you know, 
be a, a major resource for this exhibit and then to take them on a trip to Mexico to learn the origins of chocolate, go to cacao plantations and things like that. Um, so Elaine decided, well, yeah, I'll do it, but you know, I'd like some other people to go along with me. And so she invited Mike and me to go too. So we said, of course, <laughs> you know. So we went, that was in 1999, and we went to Mexico and really, you know, found out a lot about chocolate that we didn't know about and how, um, especially in Mexico, it's it's not a religion, but it is part of their heritage to have chocolate. And, and it was the belief of the Olmecs and then the Mayans and the Aztecs that, um, that the god Quetzalcoatl brought the cacao beans to people in Mexico to grow those beans. And so it's, it is. It's, uh, when you walk in the fields in the cocoa plantations and you talk to the people there who have anything to do with chocolate making, it is. It's, it's a, a mystical agree. experience. It's, it's really neat. So we were really happy. Uh, we got to go on that trip and we went to Oaxaca, Mexico. We went to both the state of uh, Oaxaca and, and Tabasco. Tabasco is where the cacao plantations are and then Oaxaca is more of a manufacturing place. Now, Mexico doesn't export a lot of um, cocoa beans anymore, but they still, you know, they still have a business and they still have probably some of the best beans that there there are. Um, more so than Switzerland? You think? Uh, yeah. the Well, Switzerland is only a processor. Okay. Um, it's a country, and they, depending on the company, they get their beans. You have coke, the cacao tree can only grow like 20 degrees north or south of the equator. So most of the growing takes place in South America, uh, Latin America, Mexico, then in um, in Africa. The Ivory Coast is a huge producer of cocoa beans, and then um, and the Far East, then you get into Malaysia sure, area. They, they do more. And then it's usually companies in Belgium, Switzerland, and everything that do the processing right, of the understand. beans. So okay. they, yeah. yeah. And then, just like Hershey does, they get their beans. And, you know, so, um, but a lot of places have started doing, you know, just like single bean chocolates. They'll, they'll just use beans from Venezuela or beans from uh, Ivory Coast or, or wherever it is. So, you know, the fancier chocolates. Yeah. Hershey uses a mixture. You know, everybody has their own recipe. Do you think that, isn't Hershey, no, no, something coming out with maybe not as much sugar or, or in the candy or, or not? Yeah, and that's one of the things, you know, when we teach about chocolate is that you know, you probably, if you grew up in the United States, you probably grew up eating Hershey oh, chocolate. Oh, yeah, right. And it's a whole different experience than, you know, your dark, really dark chocolates that have very little sugar. I mean, some of the chocolates are almost like baking chocolate. With oh, yeah, the, ba the baking. Very right. little, little, little sugar. Right. Um, and Hershey is changing some formulations to... You know, to and and they have some some nice chocolates now that have less sugar, more of the really the the cocoa bean in, in it. it. Right, so it's much yeah. richer. Yes, right. yes, yeah. much richer. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, and they've also bought some uh, companies that that specialize in finer chocolates, Scharfenberger and jo Joseph Schmidt. Hershey has bought them. So. Yeah. That, that, that's very interesting. And you still give some talks? Do you do any that when you're down in Florida? Uh, we haven't in Florida, but there is an adult education program a little bit north of us um, in this place called The Villages. It's a, a large community up there, and they do have some higher education or some adult, uh, adult education. And so I think we're going to go talk to them about maybe doing our chocolate 
Uh, that would be nice. Class. They'd appreciate We've done it. it three times at Walla, and then we've done some special event type things and stuff. You like bring that, it down so. south, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what about the Special Olympics? Tell us a little about you've been involved with that. Yeah, we, we got involved. We, uh, uh, my husband and I, don't have any children, and our nieces and nephews have pretty much all grown up in Michigan, and so you know we get to see them some, and we take them on vacations and things, but. Uh, we and both of us are very active as far as sports go. We really like sports and exercise and everything. So we decided to get involved with a volunteer project where there would be kids and there would be sports. We thought that would be a good mix, and Special Olympics certainly fills right. that bill. Right. Uh, we didn't know at the time we volunteered for Special Olympics that it's all ages. It's you, you have to be eight years old to actually do competition, but you can be 102. If you can still bowl, you can still participate. Sure. So, uh, And we really found out we liked working with, with uh, young adults uh, in Special Olympics. And we started out um, as volunteers, you know, doing timing and scoring on the track. And while then, you were still here at Purdue? Yeah, okay. while we were still here. Yeah, that was in 1982 and uh, that we first started volunteering. Then we started uh, getting more into coaching, and my husband started a powerlifting program and uh, has taken powerlifters to world competition in Special Olympics. We started a tennis program in Tiffany County, and um, I was lucky enough to go as the tennis coach for, for World Games uh, in 1991. And... Uh, so we, we basically, until we retired, we did coaching uh, the actual sports. In about 1998, a program started in Special Olympics. Uh, I can't remember what it was called first. Now it's called Athlete Leadership Programs, and that's what we really are involved with now. It's basically teaching Special Olympics athletes um, how to give speeches, um, how to be on boards and committees, how to um, give input on what would make Special Olympics better, uh, how to be coaches themselves. Uh, some of our higher functioning athletes are tremendous coaches. They really understand what it is to have a mental disability and maybe how you have to learn a little bit differently. So some of the higher functioning ones coaching some of the lower functioning or younger teams it is a really perfect fit. Um, some of our athletes have become officials also. So we... That's uh, wonderful. Yeah, Good it's, to see that. It's, it's great. We have... There's one young guy we started working with when I think he was a bit, Mike was about 12 years old then and he was in powerlifting and track and field and basketball and we coached him in different things he um, got interested at the very beginning of this athlete leadership program that he wanted to go talk to people about Special Olympics and so he got training in speech and it used to be he wouldn't say a word to anybody and now uh, he's now 37 years old. He's uh, he is uh, a certified EMT. He has he and his wife have adopted three children. They started out with foster children. When they found out they couldn't have their own children, his his wife is not mentally handicapped. Um, when they found out they couldn't have ch their own children they decided that they would take in foster children. They have adopted three siblings. They're, they're half-siblings. Same mother, different fathers. And they're raising these three kids. They they were over on Sunday after oh, they live here the in game. Town? They live, they actually uh, live in um, not Oxford. Uh, but out in the community. So yeah, right, in, sure. in Benton County. Right. And um, so, and, and Mike now works, he, he's a custodian at uh, Benton Central High School, and his wife is an aide at, at Benton Central. Um, 
they meant she worked in a group home. He never, Mike never lived in a group home. He always lived with his mom, but uh, he would, you know, he would go to group homes to either pick up athletes or some stuff like that. And so they met each other, and, and they've been married for 11 years now, I think. And, Isn't that uh, nice? And they're wonderful, wonderful parents. And, uh, you know, it's, it's nice to see that. You know? it's, it's great. And, and, you know, a lot, his confidence came from being able to do well at sports through Special Olympics. He really, he finally do. could do something and people wouldn't make fun of him that he couldn't read or he couldn't do this or that. And uh, then going out and speaking about Special Olympics and uh, all around the state. I mean, he does it all around the state. He's now on the management team that puts on summer games in Indiana for Special Olympics, and he's the safety guy. He's the one who goes around and finds anything. You know, like there, if there are cords out, and they need to be covered up, and he goes and looks for all those issues. And he's he's part of the team, and he's treated just like anybody else. But he he has super confidence now. Isn't that nice? And a lot of the athletes that we see starting out in, they don't want to get up and speak in front of any. It's that's it's okay. that's hard for anybody. And uh, but once they start getting that confidence, and once they and start participating, up, brings it out. Yeah, right. And we have things called input councils where. You can just go and give your input about what you think would make Special Olympics better. You know, should we add sports? Should we, you know, do our coaches need better training? Whatever. And athletes who you would never, you've never heard from before will, you know, come out and say, well, at swimming, I think they should do this, you know? And so it's It's, it's good to hear from them. That's that right. That they have a voice. And, <clears throat> excuse me, and we're doing this now. We... We still come back uh, to Indiana and teach classes. And my husband does a technology class. He teaches the athletes to use email and uh, the web and everything. Especially, you know, it's great for them to be to go to websites like if we're doing fundraisers to go and you know find they can find out all sorts of stuff on the internet. Of, of That's course. good, right? And. Uh, he teaches safety also on the internet, but um, and I do the classes on being on boards and committees and things like that, and uh, we also do that in Florida, and we also are on a international group that consults on athlete leadership programs. So uh, that was why we went to Hawaii was for a meeting of that sure. group. That's very yeah. nice. Uh, so it's we don't rewarding. we yeah we don't coach sports anymore. We still go and watch you know athletes. That's and nice. Everything, but we but you're also your, your input is just a little bit different level. Yeah. And you're helping them yeah. from another standpoint, yeah. which is and it's it all is part of it. Yeah, which is really good. And gosh, Florida boy, their state games are at um, uh, Wide World of Sports at Disney. Wow, that's an incredible event. It's it's I a, bet. a really yeah. neat event. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, were you ever a faculty fellow at all? No, no. I oh, was okay. not. No, okay. I don't know why I didn't. Yeah, it, no, it's I interesting. Wasn't. Of course, that program, as I've talked to some other people, is changing a little bit because of the food facilities now that they oh, have the central. And used yeah. to be able, like Tarkington, for oh, example. Yeah. And but it, it's still an ongoing. It's a really good program. Yeah. Then. And and I think, uh, you know, the the student contact that I treasured the most was having student interns. We would always try to have interns in our office, and uh, some, that's great. Some much better than others, and some have gone on to to great careers. One works for the NCAA in Indianapolis, and um, I really enjoyed that. You know, I liked the student contact number one and number two. You know, trying to you know give people some real world situations that they would be working right. in. Right, and mentor them and a little everything. bit while they're yeah. here. Right, yeah. It yeah. goes along with the education. Yeah. Tell us a little about family, your, your husband, and, and what you're doing now in retirement. Oh, uh, my husband uh, was, well, he started at Purdue when he was still a student. He got a job in 
What was then? Is he from Indiana? He's from Battle Creek, Michigan. Okay. I'm from the racing capital of the United States, Indianapolis, and he's from the cereal capital of <laughs> the United <laughs> States, <laughs> Battle Creek. There you go. And we met at Purdue at a fraternity and sorority trade dinner. We had our first date uh, the night before the Rose Bowl, the very first Rose Bowl Purdue went to. He went with some of his fraternity brothers out there. I went with some of my sorority sisters. One of my sorority sisters and one of his fraternity brothers were dating, and we wound up meeting each other. And we had met earlier, and he had asked me out. I was dating somebody else. Uh, I think that was October or November, and he never called me. I said, but call me back sometime. And he never did, but then we met up again in California. So, And uh, so it was appropriate that that was our, so that was our first date, and my last activity at, at Purdue was going to the Rose Bowl uh, in 2001. Wow. And I, I was going to, uh, Mike retired at the end of, uh, well, I what think What department last, did he work in at Purdue? He, he was, okay, he was in Central Business Data Processing and Administrative Data Processing. And then I think when he left, when he retired, it was called Management Information, and it's uh-huh. now ITAP. Um, he he. It's all been folded in. Yeah, right. and he joined the department when there was probably twenty twenty five people. They were in Hovde, then they moved over to Enad, and right. it was very small. Harry Herschel was uh, him, right? well. Gosh, I think Tom Delay was before Harry, uh, but Harry Herschel was probably Mike's Mike's longest term boss and favorite boss. Harry wonderful guy. I don't know if you've done I haven't. Anything. I have to be. Uh, that's a good You name. know, he would be uh, great, and he lives out at Westminster. And uh, I've seen his, an article or something in the paper, yeah. and his name, I, I, I recognize his yeah. name, because I remember and I, I see him, said seen him when he was here. Yeah, and he was in another I can't remember what Harry was in before he took over ADPC, but he he really took them from you know, a, a very small department. Too. And really expanded. That's yeah. Right. yeah. N- not as big as it is now. Uh, and that, all of the ITAP in combination pretty much happened after Mike retired. But uh, he basically, Mike has always been uh, involved somehow with capacity planning, which is uh, figuring out how big a computer uh, you need and everything to do it more efficiently. Uh, he looks at what they have now and goes, oh, oh, if we had only had that much money in every day, you know. <laughs> Understand. Uh, and uh, he, he still, you know, keeps in touch with people in his department. Yeah. They go out to lunch once a week and they muse about how if they were just doing a lot of these things on the mainframe, they may not be having the problems there they're go, having. Right. But, but that's uh, but to How'd keep you have busy, to decide to go to Flor- to move to Florida. Did you uh, plan that when you left? I think the the biggest thing that was pushing us over the edge is that we we really liked being in West Lafayette. However, uh, both of us like to exercise, and we. Uh, in the winter, we would just, it, it would get to be, you know, sort of a hassle of getting out and going every day right. and stuff like that. And I think the lack of sunshine just got to, Mike spent his entire career, I think when they first built Freehafer, he had a window. They were in the lower level, but they, the, those windows extended down. Sure, I understand. And so he had a window for maybe a year of his career. Other than that, he was always inside some kind of room with no windows. And the the first couple of uh, weeks that of retirement, he just sat next to the window and just said, (laughs) "Oh, this is so great to be because you know." There are days that you go to work in the dark, you come home in the dark. Right, and, exactly. You know, and this is the time of year when you're doing that. I understand. Yeah. And uh, so I, I think we made a decision. We needed to be someplace a little bit warmer. We started looking in Tennessee. We 
uh, looked in Texas, Mississippi. We went a whole lot of different places. And Which Flo- is a good thing. Other people have done the same thing. <laughs> Florida. Emily did. She checked out a few places, yeah. too. I'm sorry, who did? Emily. Yeah. She checked out. Yeah. And Florida was probably last on our list. My parents had retired there, and uh, and they were both, uh, had both passed away by the time we decided that we were going to go someplace. But they always lived close to the coast, and they always lived in really populated areas. They lived just south of Clearwater and Tampa, uh, Tarpon Springs. And when we would come to visit them, it was like all this traffic and all this, you know, it was so hard to get any place, and it was just old people and blah, blah, blah. And um, so we had put off looking in Florida, and then we had scheduled uh, a month that we were going to go to South Carolina, and there was a huge ice storm in South Carolina. We really thought Clemson was where, was going to be it. Well... It, it we uh, went there at the wrong time, and so we decided we had the names of some places in over 55 communities in Florida uh, that we thought we'd check out, and we decided we fell in love with one that was right in the middle of the state, not much traffic around, uh, but water there. There's a chain of lakes, right? Uh, our addition is on one of the lakes, and... Uh, just decided that was the place and then it takes us an hour and a half to drive to the ocean and an hour and a half to drive to the gulf which is not too bad at all uh, so we just said okay this this looks good and we felt comfortable there sure uh and both of us really liked disney one of the things in each state we did visit the special olympics state office We were very impressed with Florida Special Olympics and found out that we would be able to continue working with athlete leadership. That was important to us. uh, Sure, because you've been involved with it. Yeah. And um, so we we did choose an over-55 community, uh, not because we don't like having kids around or anything like that, but it just seemed like that was a it was a good situation. They they had things like clubhouses and, right. and different organizations. So we uh, we got the, the one we were in uh, the community that we're in had uh, you know had a group with motorcycles. And my husband ha- has a motorcycle, and so there's a group to go riding with. Uh, they have a, a boat, a huge boat club. So. And Lots of activities, which is great, yeah. that, that are of interest to you both of yeah. you. Yeah, and uh, I grew up, my, my parents had a cottage on Lake Freeman, and I grew up uh, with uh, going there every weekend and loving boating and everything. So neither one of us fish, but we just love to go out on the boat and put the anchor out and mm-hmm. sit and read and just oh. listen to the birds and, Sound of, and sounds look good. at the alligators. And, <laughs> right. and there's there's really a lot of nature things to do around us. There are, there are not bike trails that we can leave from our community and go to, but very close there are a whole bunch of bike trails also. And so we Sounds like we a like great to, setup. Yeah, go biking. And uh, great places for, for us to to run the our clubhouse has a really nice pool so we swim a lot so it was just you know perfect a, right you know, and but you still decided to keep your place here we we sold our home and bought a condo in uh camelback yeah, yeah. that works and, out nicely there. yeah because we we knew we wanted to still come back for football season and at least part of basketball sure. season and uh we miss the bat the basketball we started going to women's basketball up at University of Florida, which is only about an hour and a half from us, um, when Carolyn Pack was the coach, they really didn't have a very good team. Uh, we, uh, we've we gone to Stetson to some games, and this year I think we're going to try Central Florida uh, to go to some of the women's and men's basketball okay. games. So yeah. there, there are schools around where we can sure. go, but we, I don't I don't know that I'm ever going to become a Gator fan. <laughs> <laughs> Better not, I don't right? think that would. Right, yeah. yeah. Um, 
So that to post pretty, any awards or honors that you've gotten that you'd like to share with us that come to mind, anything special? My, you know, I perspective did win some case awards when when uh, good and 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 that, but I think uh, for me, uh, I when I won Volunteer of the Year. Uh, in the state of Indiana for Special Olympics because that was voted on by, you know, other people who, who volunteer. Uh, I also got the Leadership Lafayette Distinguished Alumni Award, and I'm really proud of that because uh, it, that Leadership Lafayette, which I, I haven't mentioned before, but I think that was a tremendous experience uh, to find out so much more about the community and all of the opportunities that there are here to volunteer and all the needs that there are and everything. And uh, I, I just learned a tremendous amount and uh, always encouraged uh, people who I worked with to go through that program if they could. Yeah. And Julie Rosa, who who is now in the same sure. position I'm I think Patty Jeske has that. also gone through that program, too. I think she, Patty Jeske did, yeah. too, as well. Yes. It yeah. really is a good program. Yeah, it's and, a great uh, program. following up on what you're saying, you learn more about the community other than within the university, yeah. things that you, even though you're here, you're not that quite aware yeah. of. Them. Yeah. And, and uh, the other thing we sort of, I mean, I we both miss is the West Lafayette Library. I think the libraries here at Purdue are wonderful, and I think our West Lafayette Library is wonderful. It's it, to me, you know, just all of the libraries in this area. Uh, we have a, a wonderful county library system. That was one thing that really turned us off in Tennessee when we went to some of the local libraries. That's another thing we we looked at. We were, sure. One of the libraries we went to didn't even have didn't even get USA Today much less the New York Times. It was just like, they got their local paper. And that was about <laughs> it. And in Florida, we do have, a, a, our, our county is called Lake County, and we have a, a, not, a very nice library system in that county. So you can go to multiple libraries and everything. But And we have not gone to either Central Florida or University of Florida libraries, but uh, you could you know, if you wanted yeah, to. That's yes, right. Yeah. As long as the, as the city or the county serves your purpose, yeah, and, then that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, and and I still stay active with West Lafayette uh, Public Library. I I'm on the the friends board there, and I go to meetings when I'm in town. And I that's know, very good. You know, it is. It's a nice there. a nice library. Yeah. 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 How about a favorite Purdue tradition? An outstanding event. Anything that comes to mind? Well, you know. You shared a lot of them, but my I guess it, this is dorky, but homecoming is just wonderful. Right. It, it's uh, you get to see a, a lot of y your classmates and friends. Uh, I think that's a great thing. It really, you know, and people come back and, and they do it right here at Purdue. Right. I, you know, maybe they do it right everywhere, but I just I think Purdue has. Uh, uh, a great tradition uh, with homecoming and the fraternities and sororities do also we always go to my husband's fraternity we used to go to my sorority until they they went off campus but uh, uh, and that gives you a chance it's just a great opportunity yeah it is and uh, I think since I came to Purdue in the middle of my college career. I didn't have the opportunity. You know, I didn't do things like Block P or things like that. But <clears throat> I also think the mortar board, I, you know, is is a great thing. I mean, uh, yeah. and the fact that mortar board has provided so many scholarships and, uh, and uh, Dean Cook was the advisor for mortar board when, when I, uh, was chosen for motor board, and I, I, I really think that what that organization and what, you know, I never got involved with student government, but I saw that and a lot of good things that they get, did, right, right. and the exponent also I think is 
is, you know, a nice tradition. In it is. To, it's very good. It's have. a nice mix. Yeah. 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 Any special event that you'd like to share? Or any and closing comments and summary that you'd think of? The only, the only thing I want to say is that I'm really, I want to thank you for this project. I think that too often we forget our history. And uh, it, it seems like, you know, we've had, uh, Purdue had such a long-term president with, with President Hubby, right. and then Art Hansen was here for quite some time, and Dr. Beering was here for quite some time. But now I think Purdue, it looks like we may be in store for shorter-term presidents like other universities seem have to have. have experienced and uh, I I think when that happens, maybe some of the history, some of the traditions, some of the things that went before, are are not cherished as as much as they should be. Um, and I think this this project, I think uh, the the Reamers and doing their traditions book. Uh, was fantastic, and I I was so excited to be able to edit that book and you know right. really look at some of the traditions and everything uh, more closely. And uh, but but I think having a respect for what ha- has has gone before is still very important. And I think you know what you're doing here, and then what uh, I, I think what the Reamer Club, what some other organizations are trying doing. to do, uh, and the project, the the web project and everything that Carl's doing, I think will really help further further that process. Right, good. So I thank you, Lynn. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. I appreciate that.